everyone. You've tuned into UJ Sport on UJ TV. My name is Colin Maipa. I'm a communications coordinator at UJ Sport and the host of UJ Sport on UJ TV show. Here we speak to different um, athletes, be it student athletes or professionals who've been involved in sport in the past or currently, or people that have uh, a role to play in the sporting fraternity. So today I'm joined by none other than the successful head coach of the UJ Senior Men's Football Club. I'm talking about Mr. Karabo Mohudi. Sir. Thank you for having me. This one, I just wanted to find out who you are, where you come from, and because you've been doing so well for UJ. Um, some people may not know who you are. They know the team, they know you are the coach, but they don't know where you come from, how long you've been involved with the football as a, as a, as a profession. And um, yeah, this episode basically is just to get to understand who you are, where you come from, and what you've done at UJ. Obviously, you've come from other places as well. And building up to the success, what are the sort of things that shaped you as a human being? Besides just football, um, I'm interested in knowing uh, what makes you tick, the kind of family setting that you came from, stuff like that. Um, Mohudi to me sounds sepedi setswana. Are you are you mopedi or are you mutswana? Yeah. So yeah, um, uh, my name is Karabo Mohudi. So the Mohudi surname obviously so, comes from the Mohudi family who are from I think Palabora, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Tafel Cop, and. Also, part of my lineage is, is the Kabu Sealers from Rustenburg. So yes, uh, you are correct in, in, in your session of, of being linked to the Tswana people and also the Bapedi people. Yes. So yeah, uh, grew up in a Tswana and Pedi household. So bilingual in, in, in Tswana and, 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 and Sepedi. Yes. So yeah. Uh, you, are, you are correct. Okay. So I was born in, in Springs, but mostly raised as a young man in, in, in Rustenburg, Haratau, uh, around Makwiling, if people know the areas. And obviously, the aim was always to come back to Gauteng, you know, the Golden City, and study there, and hopefully prosper. You know, that's mm -hmm. what most families want their, their kids uh, to to achieve, you know, prosperity in the big cities, you know. So that's why I am now in the big city. Mm -hmm. My life is based mm here. -hmm. My life is based here now. Yeah, and um, of course, for somebody that grew up in Springs and grew up in Rustenburg, um, those are predominantly black communities, and we know that in townships on or rural areas like that, uh, football is one of the main sporting codes that are played there. For many youngsters, we get exposed to sport in our communities and uh, also in schools. Um, uh, unfortunately, with recently, schools have sort of abandoned the culture of sports in schools. Uh, but if you go to any community, be it Soweto, Kayelicha, Rustenburg, uh, Jane Fairs, or uh, Bush Park Ridge, anywhere, you would find a group of boys playing in a dusty street somewhere. Uh, on a ground somewhere, um, playing barefoot, uh, football there. For you, because you're doing so well in football, currently as a UJ uh, head coach, but I obviously also know the other stuff that you have done before you came to UJ. Have you always been a soccer fanatic? Have you always played sport, football particularly? Um, and, and saw that as a career that you'd like to take in the future? Or were you doing other things? I know that some athletes here at UJ, for instance, they were first, um, uh, they, they did athletics, and then, then because athletics, it's, it's a seasonal sport, yeah. uh, especially in schools and townships. Uh, it's not something that runs consistently the whole year. Um, so football would be something that you automatically play because it's there all the time. Have you always been somebody that wants to be involved in sport or did you have any other ambitions when you were still a youngster? Yeah, so I think playing the game was obviously 
something we did recreationally, you know, during lunch, uh, after school, certain times. Mm. Uh, while I was still at Leeds uh, Primary School in Sakane, yeah. uh, we, we played football a lot during break and during, you know, uh, lunch and obviously after school. But what you are speaking about is actually uh, uh, bringing back memories that even though we played football predominantly during our spare time, we played a lot of football. Mm -hmm. But the school's athletic program was also very active. So we did athletics, you know, mm -hmm. track and field at school. So we ran during certain times of the year into house, uh, and then we'll go into districts and so forth. So that aspect of sport has always been there. When I went to high school, that's when I started playing formal football for the Orlando Pirates uh, football club uh, youth programs back in, in, the 90, in the early 90s, 89, 90, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Without giving under away 12, your, your under, age. Now I'm giving away my, my age. <laughs> Yeah, as an under 12, up to under 14, before we moved as a family uh, to Fosslora, so we played for 40s, you know, the team was called 40s. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then it, it grew from there, from my travels, and then I landed in Soweto, you know, again, back to Soweto, uh, in, in Shawelo, and I played for my Petra Barcelona then. And that's where a lot of things really clicked. Mm -hmm. You know, because even as a player then, I used to speak to the coaches a lot, you know, about, hey, coach, what if you play this one here? And then he can do one, two, three, you know. And the coach would be like, oh, okay, fun again, okay, let, let's try it. And then he'll do it, you know, and we'll succeed. Yeah. And So uh, is, is that where your, your, your coaching yeah, abilities so, yeah. sort of started to mushroom? Yeah, I suspect yeah. so, because in, even in one of the tournaments, uh, in the final, I asked the coach, hey, coach, uh, change Sam into being a goalkeeper, you know, because I think he'll do well then, we'll win the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what? The coach changed Sam, he made him a goalkeeper. Sam saved three goals and we, we won, you know. Mm -hmm. So already that was there and that was before I moved to Vets. And at Vets, that's where a lot of things happened. Uh, when I finished playing due to a, an, an injury at the time, a very bad shin injury, mm -hmm. uh, which nearly cracked my bone at the time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, at least I was also in school. I was I was at university, studying university as well there. Yeah. What What were you studying? At uh, I did lecture engineering. No, I was at West Tech, so oh, I studied okay. at West Tech, which is now UJ. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So uh, that's the Pantin Road campus. No, Pantin Campus. Yeah, okay. TFC. Yeah. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> so during that time, I also returned to vets uh, as a, I wanted to be, to assist in any way because I knew that I wanted to do something in football, coaching. Mm -hmm. And I became the manager. Uh, the, the, the general manager said, no, oh, okay, yeah, you know what, we need a manager actually and an assistant coach for the team. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So I did the administrative work, but I also did the assistant coaching duties, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where it all started really. I started doing my coaching courses. Yeah, and I, I became better at it. And yeah. So I, I I wanted to I I, I want to get to the professional stuff. That obviously to become a successful coach, um, you are required to undergo certain um, training yeah. or complete certain qualifications for you to be regarded as a coach in certain um, streams of of the game, right? But before we get to that one, I just wanted to find out, as a youngster growing up, either in Springs or Soweto or, or Rustenbeck, who were the, the players that you looked up to? Um, because I think that, that's what shapes a lot of youngsters who go into sports. Um, you go into a certain sport because you like a certain player or a certain team. So for you, um, who was the player that you looked up to during those times when you were still upcoming? And then what was your favorite team at the time and what inspired that? Because I know that also family dynamics play a part in people choosing teams. Yeah. yeah. So because when, when, 
when you grow up in a certain environment, obviously you get influenced uh, by who you support. And obviously, when you're in Orlando, you're an Orlando Pirates fan. So that's where the, 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 the basis of supporting Orlando Pirates at the time started. But uh, obviously, I'd always liked the likes. Yeah, I've liked a lot of good quality players at Kaiser Chiefs. Yeah, yeah and good quality players at Orlando Such Pirates. Is. Yo, at Kaiser Chiefs, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, Orlando Pirates is a lot, you know. Uh, I think those two teams at the time were at their prime, and uh, most of the star players went to them. You know, your Scaratin Twas, your Shane McGregor's, your Fanny Martinez. It was just crazy. There was a lot of them, you know, at Pirates. Uh, oh, so many at Pirates. I would, I would list 20 players. You know, a Pozoto Makanya, you know, a Brandon Silent, a Basil Steenkamp. So, yeah, I'm, I'm revealing my age with, with, with some of these <laughs> Yeah, guys. well, at least I've been, I know yeah, those players you know, that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, so, yeah. so I'm also up there, yeah. yeah. There's Christian Camps, you know. To a certain extent, your Pio Nagueras, you know, there's, there's quite a lot. Your Ian Palmer, who was yeah. a, the late Ian Palmer, a, a good coaching friend of mine. Uh, sadly, yeah, he, he, he's, he's, departed. Yeah, he's departed. Yeah, yo, it's, it's, it's a lot of players uh, from Orlando Pirates. Yeah. Why? Because uh, your Nick, your Pazuga Sishweni, you know, there's a lot. Why? Because as an Orlando Pirates youth at the time, we were the ones who washed their jerseys, you know, at the White House opposite Orlando Stadium. We were the ones who washed those, those Chibuku and Fruity jerseys. So, so you, were, you were that close yeah, to yeah, the yeah. team? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, were, okay. we were very close to the team. And uh, we washed their jerseys. As I mentioned, I, we used to wash them, you know, like, yeah, today I'm washing... Yeah, yeah. Pazuga oh, why are you always washing Pazuga in the jersey, you know? Yeah, 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 he's my favorite player, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, so and that's we, where the, the, the love for football started. Yeah, that's yeah. where the love for football started. We supported, we went to all their matches at Orlando Stadium. We always went in for free because we... As youth, we... <laughs> there's, we there's always creative way. ways of yeah, getting into the stadium. Ways. Yeah. One was we... I don't know how it helped, yeah. but uh, we, we polished the old people's shoes and they gave us some coins. Yeah, and yeah. We accumulated enough to buy ourselves food from the mamas there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, also... Like a typical in, township, township yeah, boy. You know, we, we hustled our way. <laughs> yeah. And but, uh, we watched them very closely, you know, the great Jomo Sono, yeah. you know, wow, it, it was just, yeah, it, it was something else. And, and I understand during those times, those were the very interesting times with football in South Africa. Uh, for me, I think uh, I never got the chance. I think I was still very young. I, I've never watched Jomo Sono play, but I watched some of the people that came just after him. Uh, I remember during my time, I watched the, um, the likes of Ace and Tolengue. Uh, I was a Kaiser Chiefs fan, yeah. so um, Dr. Kumalo at the time, Tia Mapike, um, uh, Robson Muchichwa, Teenage Lala. Uh, my favorite was Prime Baloi, the Spider-Man, because I was a goalkeeper myself growing up. Um, um, I used to compete with my friends in the, in the rural areas there. We played, um, uh, we would put two, two poles that side and then two poles here, just maybe some rocks or some buckets one bucket here, one bucket. So I would shoot to him, and then one friend is on the other side, on this side, I shoot to him, he shoots to me. Yeah. And then the other guy, we, fortunately we supported the same team, so we would want to know who is the best Spider-Man between the two. And it was interesting during that time as well, uh, especially in the goalkeeping uh, department. For us as youngsters, we looked up to the likes of William Okpar at, at Orlando Pirates, John Tlale at Mamelodi Sundowns, um, it, it was very interesting. Those were the two, the three different um, big goalkeepers at the time when we were coming up. And uh, it inspired me um, a lot. Uh, unfortunately, we were in the rural areas. I don't think football scouts made it there. I, I, I still believe that the guys that played in the rural areas that were good at the time never got an opportunity to, to play for big teams like Orlando Pirates, Kaiser Chiefs, or just even being seen playing with uh, uh, for teams here well, in the listening, city. Just listening to, to stories of, of the former professionals, uh, like 
a uh, uh, Williams of Para, you know, yeah. I went to coaching courses with him, a John Clale, I went to courses yeah. with him, coaching courses with him. Yeah. And I, I'm inquisitive. I, I ask a lot of questions, you know. I, I always wanted to know their journeys. And b- me being a, a football coach also, it was important to know all these other aspects of their lives, you know. How did they get to play? Where were they sported? You know, and a lot of them, funny enough, schools, football, school tournaments were where they were, they were identified, you know. And some of them, like uh, uh, Helman Kellele, you know, when we speak, he'll tell you about his journey and he'll tell you how important it was for him to put himself out there when they had trials at Joma Cosmos and there was just so many people there. That and, were good. Yeah, that were good, but... He knew that if, if, if they had one day to trial and there were so many people, he might not get a chance yeah. if, if he just remained in the shadows. Yeah, if yeah, he yeah. just waited to be called. And when they called teams, he was one of Always the best there. ones to be there. Yeah. What that helped him with, he says, is that obviously the guys who are identifying the talent, who are recruiting, are still fresh as well. They're still a little bit awake, you know, mm-hmm. they still have energy to watch uh, properly. And that's what happened. He got selected from those trials and mm-hmm. uh, that's how he made it. And so, he made it, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's interesting to, to listen to, to how these some guys. of these guys make it yeah. into, into football. And uh, yeah. it also shapes you as a coach to say, mm, okay, what can I do better in order to see more? Yeah. Because, yes, he put himself ahead. What about the 1,000th guy who's there and who's the, as, as good as who him who's as good as him yeah. but or even better than him but two hours yes. when I'm tired or maybe I've gone to the to the toilet and it's his turn to play and mm-hmm. then I don't see him you know yeah. so you obviously had to look at strategies to do better recruitment yeah. uh, strategies to to scout better mm. so yeah very interesting so you 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 then um, went on to coach at Vets. You explained that you joined there as a team manager and then you started doing administrative work as well. And then fast forward going, um, you, you started being involved uh, with their team more. Yeah. And um, and I understand you started there as a player, of course. You played with the likes of Stanton Fredericks. Um, well, I think he came the year before me. Before you. Yeah, it was the yeah. same period. It was the same period, yeah. yeah. He was the uh, team of 95. Yeah, uh, we were the team of '96. Okay. So that was his transition to to professional football. He was so good. He yeah. was so good. Yeah. Uh, no know, wonder he even went to play yeah, for Kaiser Chiefs. He was, well. a, he was a screaming talent. You yeah. Know? If you were there to watch football, uh, it was Stanton Fredericks, uh, Money Eyes, Alistair. You know, mm. you knew uh, yeah. that these guys should be in professional football. But yeah, your Junaid Hartley, I think, was. The year before, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but yeah, those 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 guys were were screaming talents, you know. Uh, they were talents that could not be ignored. Yeah. Of course, there are other guys as well, but yeah, those were yeah, those were the guys at for, the time. For someone that started playing football from that time, a long time ago, and having rubbed shoulders and played and, and and interacted with some of these successful players that went on to play professional football in South Africa. Uh, even even outside of South Africa, um, do you think that has shaped the kind of coach that you are now? And um, also, what did you have to study in addition to you interacting and playing with those players at the time for you to become the kind of coach that you have become today? Yeah, I was I was quite fortunate. I think in life you 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 have chance meetings, chance chance encounters uh, with certain people who are great influencers in terms of coaching you know I'll tell you one obviously the big one is is coach uh, the late Ted Dumitru uh, he was running a center in Soweto in, in, in yeah at the Orlando Stadium yeah he was running a center there a center of excellence and in metric I actually met up with him at the center, but it just so happened that he lived around the block to where I was studying, you know, I was schooling mm-hmm. at Barato Park High School. So yeah. 
when when we had to go, it was uh, you'd always have transport issues from there going to Soweto and then coming back home, you know. So I was lucky that at the time he said, no, 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 okay. If you are out early, you know, I'll wait for you. We'll go together. And that for me, I think, was one of the, the most important encounters in my life to say, yo, oh, wow. And then we'll speak about football. I don't know how much I understood at the time, uh, but... So yeah. there's a lot that uh, shaped you as a yeah, coach there's now. A lot, there's a lot. Besides just being a player. Yeah. And the process is at the center of excellence themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, how we, the process, the, the training methods, the coaching methods that they used, uh, Coach Ted Dimitri and the late, well, both the late Ted Dimitri and Coach Mandla uh, Mazibubo at the time. You know, mm. Their training methods, and some of them have stuck with me, and I, I use some of them, obviously, you have to tweak a little bit yeah. because the, the time frames are not the same and the, the paradigms are not the same. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, as I mentioned, those are some of the most important people that I met yeah. that, that shaped a little bit of how I view the game. And obviously, the gentleman I was working with, Coach Floyd Mokhale, yeah. he's part of the, the, the people being mentored by Coach Ted Dumitru. Uh, so already there was a follow-up yeah. to that process and we we as the coaching team at Vets uh, under 19s of the Vets calls at the time yeah. we followed the same methodology uh, that coach Dimitri was basically mentoring them so yeah it's, uh, those chance encounters were, were very important yeah, in, yeah. in shaping how I coach you became, and how yeah. I view the game as well now um, I I, I one of the things that I like about you, um, you strike me as somebody who's uh, very cal calculative. You're very calm. You don't panic in situations. I see this mostly in your game management when you coach the, the senior uh, men's team here at UJ. Um, if you concede, th there's no panic buttons that are being pressed. Um, you always follow your game plan. And, uh, and, and in most cases, you emerge victorious. You go on and to win games and whatnot. Um, is this part of uh, the coaching training courses that you, you take? That, or is it just you personally as a calm somebody that you need to assess situations, manage them better, and uh, with, the, with, with the anticipation or expectation that things will change? You know that if I you know, follow this plan or take this approach, things will always unfold. Um, I've never heard of any incidents in your team. I mean, I've been with UJ Sport now. This is my third year. Um, I've never had any incidents of players that are doing things that are unruly or whatever. The way you manage your team seems to be the way that your life is, even, even you personally, outside of um, the, the sporting you know, world here at UJ Sport. Um, how important is it as a coach that you you lead a life that can influence the other people that that that, that you manage. I mean, we hear that uh, in a lot in the the Premier League, for instance, that you've got big stars there, people that earn big monies, right? Um, and they obviously have uh, different personalities, etc. But there are certain coaches who can manage those personalities and make them focus on one thing and which is playing football is this something that you are taught as a coach or is it something that you just have naturally as a human being yeah so within the coaching process and the coaching education processes uh, i think the most important thing that i've taken seriously uh, from from that is the other caps that the coach wears for instance uh, you you are here as their mentor. They look up to you. So you, you really have to be a proper upstanding role model for them. So simple things like being early for sessions, being prepared for sessions, you know, uh, being clear with your coaching plans, with the players, what objectives they must reach, you know. And when they don't reach them, you assist them, you know, you review. And I think that's... One of the most important things that I've done is that 
the values that I try to teach, I live them. So they don't have to be told about them. They just have to follow the role model uh, in, 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 in actioning those values, you know. So they emulate the lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, kids will be kids. You can tell him, uh, don't take that cup. But if you keep taking that cup, you'll think, oh, but why am I not allowed to take the cup when mm -hmm. he's always they taking it? They want to try. They yeah. want to try. Yeah. He says I must not smoke, yeah. but he's always smoking. So what you say, start going uh, on the back burner, and they start emulating your actions. The actions, and, uh, yeah. Repeatedly, when you do those things, they become habits, you know, and uh, that's what kids learn from adults. They learn what adults do and they, they emulate that. So what I try to do is, is be a role model to my players and that I have to be prepared. I have to, to be self-critical. I, I don't take criticism negatively. I take it as a, as a, as a, as a growth point, a learning point. And that has been the most important thing that I've seen around the players, that uh, if you live a, a value-based life and you want to implement a certain culture, the players will follow what you do and not necessarily what you say. You can say all these nice big words, but if you don't action them, uh, they're useless to the players. So that's what I've learned uh, with, with, with the coaching journey. You know, that's what I've learned with the coaching journey. And I've, I've also learned that you, you have to self-reflect a lot more. Mm -hmm. You have to be self-aware, you know, because your body language also sells a story, you know, to, to the players at training, in matches, uh, in whatever we do. Your body language always tells the players what mood you are in, what state you are in, and... Uh, if you're always in a panic state, your players will always panic as well in a match. So when I'm calm, they know, ah, oh, the, the coach has got this in control, under control. That means we have this under control. Uh, it was just a blip, you know, a, a momentary lapse of concentration. Uh, when they look at me, I, I, I have a reassuring posture. facade, yeah. posture, yeah. you know, that I, 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 I show to them. And, they are reassured that, ah, we'll mm. come back here. Mm -hmm. And that's what normally happens. Because yeah. when you panic, they panic, you go into a destructive state, a perpetual destructive state. And so, ultimately, it's yeah, going to lead to failure. Yeah. Lead to failure. So, coach, there's um, uh, players, youngsters, uh, look up to the likes of you as coaches, people that can steer them into the right direction. Uh, but then... Even businessmen themselves, CEOs of big corporations in the world, they still have people that motivate them, yeah. and that also they look up to those people. Um, for you, personally, in your own profession, um, are there any other people that you say, if I could do or achieve the same things as that person, or I think this person has led a, a very good life in terms of professional, professionalism, yeah, in terms of how they've managed and succeeded uh, in different setups where they were working, and as well as uh, maybe how they handled situations when th situations were not so so nice. Uh, that happens, that comes in any environment that people find themselves in, especially when you're not doing well as a coach. Um, if you lose matches or maybe you've been doing certain things to try and win trophies, but then you never get to reach that point that you wish to reach in your life. But fortunately for you, that doesn't apply because you've won uh, some silverware a couple of times. Um, who are the people that you look up to? It can be here in South Africa, it can be elsewhere in the world. And I want you to tell me exactly why you look up to those people. Yeah, look, I look up to a lot of people because you, you can't really look up to one person and find everything in them. So there's quite a lot of coaches around the world mm. that I look up to. There's coaches in this country I look up to, you know, and all of them, it's due to certain characteristics. For instance, overseas, I look at Marcelo Lippi, you know, I looked at uh, 
Carlo Ancelotti in, in, in how stable they are under pressure, mm, mm. you know, and that's what I've tried to emulate, you know, that, that stability, that calmness uh, under pressure. And uh, yeah, look, there's, there's a number of coaches locally, like Coach Piso, you know, very bold, mm, mm. you know, he, he tells it as it is, mm. you know, it doesn't mince his words. You know, and sometimes people think he's volatile, he's controversial. However, yeah, the truth is never easily palatable as as, as mm, lies, you know. Mm, mm, uh, <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, the, the truth is always uh, 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 full of chili, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's not easy for people to accept. To take it, yeah. And to take. And uh, he's, he speaks a lot of truth. And he speaks a lot of truth to people, and they they take it as controversial. And uh, I think they always want people to be diplomatic. And he never, you know, speaks from a the departure point of of being a, a diplomat. He's always been, you know, upfront with the truth. So yeah, there's there's quite a lot of people that I, I definitely look up to with their qualities. You know, yeah. a Jose Mourinho faced with adversity, you know, he, he come he trumps up, you know. Yeah, a, a revolutionist like uh, evolutionist or revolutionist like Pep Guardiola, you know, he is basically someone who shows that when you look at history and just, you know, how do I say it, revive different what teams. Worked, yeah, what has yeah. worked in the past, he, he takes what is there and just adapts it. Uh, he's not steadfast with his own ways of doing things. I'm from Barcelona, we're going to do the Barcelona thing here at Man City. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily. No. Of course, he'll always infuse a few of what he's learned at Barcelona. Yeah. However, he, he's always changing. He's always yeah. changing, you know, and he's always changing. And, and getting better. And getting better, you know. Who would have thought that He'll get a striker like Haaland, big guy up front, you know. Mm-hmm. He started with Messi in a false nine, but that was adaptation. He's using the best players in their best positions. Mm-hmm. So, and he's adapting always. Mm-hmm. So, and he, succeeding as well. Yeah, and yeah. he's succeeding while doing that. So it just shows that uh, you can't always look at one person. You always have to, you know. Yeah, you nibble. Yeah. You, you nibble here and here and there, you know. and. Uh, yeah, you, you put it together and you say, wow, okay, this can, work. Can, it, can it work together, yeah. you know? And yeah, of course, I've got my own characteristics as well, yeah. because my ability to learn and absorb information, my ability to, to also use that information from a practical and a theoretical perspective also, and with the characteristics of the players we have, the people we have around, uh, including the demands but also the structured UJ, you know, that I'm in and what it demands. Uh, I think that ability to put all of that together as well as a coach, I think, I think those are some of my strengths as well, to say I can do that very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can mobilize certain personnel to, to assist us. Uh, we've got a big technical team, mm-hmm. and I know what I need from each individual. You know, they know what they need to do. So also in that aspect, we, we are a team, We're a very good team. And uh, everyone pulls their weight. No one has to be told what to do. Uh, after matches, I've got my video, I've got my stats from, from the technical analyst. I've got everything. Almost my report is, is, is already made. So yeah, the guys are, are doing so well uh, from the technical perspective. Yeah. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think makes a successful coach? I think all of that. Uh, all of that. But uh, the ability to delegate, the ability to delegate because sometimes uh, a lot of people want, want to do, to take yeah, they want to do everything all at once and, mm-hmm. and do everything alone. By themselves. Yeah, but the ability to delegate and know where to delegate, who to, to delegate where. Uh, the ability to identify strengths and weaknesses in your, your, your technical personnel mm-hmm. and assist them to achieve 
what what we need to achieve as a team. Mm -hmm. I think that that's important from from the coaching yeah. perspective. You'll see that other technical teams you'll have four or five individuals there, you know, in the technical team. Others you'll have ten. Others you have twenty. So your ability to manage the twenty yeah. is what's important yeah. because in order for you to demand the twenty people, it means you know that there's twenty aspects of the game that you need to be managed. If you have five, maybe you, you are overloading your people because you don't know how to dissect the game and its detail the way it should. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I always look at big technical teams and small technical teams and think, surely there must be, there must be something uh, uh, different between the 20 and the 5. Mm, mm. You know, you've got 5 people, 5 brains, you've got 20 people, 20 brains. Wow. How what are you, these people yeah, exactly. dissecting? But they all bring a different element, they all that, bring a different makes element that makes the whole, the whole cake. Yeah. The ability of coaches to manage those processes. Yeah. I think that's what makes now, the difference. The, the other thing that I wanted to speak to you, coach, just to hear from somebody that's in the game, that's involved in sport, um, we know we are in South Africa and a lot of people share the sentiment that um, football or sport in general has sort of disintegrated in uh, especially black communities or public schools. Um, what, what do you think firstly went wrong? Because, I mean, sport used to be the thing when, when I was still in high school and there were other schools that we used to compete from January to September um, there was a school's program for sport. Uh, early, early in the year, we know that between January and April, there it used to be athletics, um, and then and then somewhere down the line, then there'll be football. There's other sporting codes as well, and we would travel with uh, from one school to another, different from province to province, playing different other schools, and that has sort of died down. I don't see that a lot in schools. The only teams that you see in communities is those that are, you know, is owned by Colin Maipa or somebody uh, in the community who loves sport. And he, you know, put a team together of young boys and um, bought a few soccer balls and a kid and tried to put a, a team together. Those things have sort of dis disappeared, went off the radar in school. And uh, the new minister of sport now has come into uh, the fray and he says that they will inject money into school sport to try and revive sports in general. For you, what do you think went wrong and what do you think can be done to bring sports back? At schools? Yeah, so, so particularly that, because that's where a, the development starts. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge topic. It's a huge topic uh, and there's no one answer for it, but it had to, to start somewhere for it to deteriorate, right? Yeah. And uh, I think number one, it started in the schools itself. Why do I say this? It's because the curriculum also grew, but the curriculum did not include sports. physical education or sport in general, but I call it physical education because that, that should be the foundation uh, of sport. You know, having those PE classes, having the right people teaching movement to kids, you know, and uh, what that has done is that they've taken your normal uh, subjects and put them into those PE classes. However, they've also expanded the curriculum to such an extent that a, a, a youngster, a, 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 a young scholar cannot uh, do anything else. But, but to focus academics. on academics yeah. only. And, and We've lost the balance of life that kids must play. You know, kids must have time for enjoyment. Kids must socialize in a way that... Uh, it builds is, is, them. Yeah, in yeah. a way that builds them in a productive manner. It gets know, them out of trouble, yeah. yeah. That gets them out of trouble. And using positive methods of, of that, which is sport, drama, you name it, sports, arts, culture, drama. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we used to do that at school. We used to do drama. We used to do athletics, football, you know, inter-house, mm -hmm. in schools. Mm -hmm. 
and and traveling just yeah. that 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 fine yeah. uh, fun uh, uh, traveling you when you know that your school is going to play to another play school in or, another province yeah. somewhere that used to bring a lot even, of excitement even, even camps themselves we used to go camping schools discipline find, also yeah, yeah, yeah. that was part of that yeah. sports itself yes. is a form of introducing discipline in in people look it's 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 a no brainer the advantages of sport help with academics yeah. the advantages of sport help with behavior if you look at the situations at most of our township schools we are struggling with a behavioral component of of young people yeah and that for me has shown me that if you don't infuse sport in school the youngsters will find a way to express themselves and unfortunately as some politicians have said that uh, when you have a a revolution that is not led uh, that is leaderless yeah, yeah. it becomes chaos yeah. so the kids are following the same methodology the same route or path yeah, yeah. where they are not led by by proper uh, proper role models or sports they teachers. start looking at different they start things looking like at different things to yeah, do and yeah. they will release their energies in inappropriate uh, uh, environments yeah. uh, so we see a lot of social ills, drug abuse, substance things. abuse, exactly. teenage but pregnancies. But kids are guided yeah. and they are helped to focus on sport or other productive ways of expressing themselves, uh, you can see the difference. Yeah. You can see the difference with how well behaved most of our student athletes are here mm -hmm. at the university because they don't have time for anything else. Yeah. They, they've got time for studies. When they're done with their yeah, studies, studies, they they go to their training fields, gyms, you know? games. So they, you you yes, maybe some of them go clubbing once in a while, but it is not in a way that it's their the energy is yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, not like the, their the number one thing here. exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and that's how sport can help. You know, it can actually focus uh, these student athletes yeah. in a better way. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why they're doing well at school. That's why they're so well behaved. Because in a sporting environment also comes the element of respect, of respecting a teammate, an opponent, you know, mm. but also in a high performance environment, yeah. you know, there are certain things. Learning how to, to, to exactly. accept defeat or to ac exactly, yeah, stuff exactly. like that. And they're learning to live within the rules. Yeah. Sport has rules. So them respecting the rules means even in the workplace they respect the rules of the workplace yeah. you know the, they last it longer. shapes the person yeah. overall no, i always it's a, it's use i use i use football as a guiding um, principle in my life um, every aspect of football i think i've tried to apply that in my life um, and i think it has helped a great deal i don't know what what i would have done what else i would have done if it wasn't sport in high school you know uh, playing volleyball or playing football as a goalkeeper growing up in the community and in the school that I that I was I went to um, and then once I left there then I came to Johannesburg to study and I focused on my studies I obviously never played sport when I got here but uh, I mean I'm, I'm still in this uh, in the sports environment now even uh, as an employee so I think that's that's very important what you're saying and very true now for you coach since you've joined UJ in 2017, right? When you came here, was it 2017? Yeah. yeah. You have turned around a lot in the UJ football club. Um, and um, you, were the, you became the first coach to win the FNB varsity football tournament. And um, you've now won two leagues, 2021, 2023. Last year you were uh, the runners-up in the um, the blue stream. Um, I think success has followed you. You have done tremendously well. Um, this is me giving you your your flowers. Uh, I I know that we always expect results from people, but we don't acknowledge or just pause for a moment to say, Coach, thank you for what you have done. Um, uh, you have done really well, and that is not only for yourself. It's not only for UJ Sport as a division, but for the University of Johannesburg brand as a whole. So when people look at the UJ team, maybe in the past we were not 
regarded as challengers in, in, in these competitions. But right now, when you a team from Pretoria or elsewhere in the country, when they go to play uh, against UJ, they know that they have to prepare really very well. And um, it's not going to be an easy thing to win against UJ. So for me, I think um, I just wanted to say to you, well done on what you have done. Um, I know that you still have a long way to go. Um, the thing that I wanted to hear from you is I would love to see you, obviously, uh, coaching one of the professional teams in the Premier uh, Soccer League here in South Africa. Where would you like to go, um, whether it's here or seeing yourself coaching any other league, whether it's in the Middle East or in Europe or Asia? Do you see yourself going beyond where you are? I don't think you would be satisfied with succeeding just here at UJ. You probably have other ambitions and... Could you please just share with us some of those? Yeah, obviously, you know, winning these championships and leagues and, and tournaments, uh, it's not just me who wins them. I think the whole technical team wins them. Uh, the, the, you know, the teamwork with the technical team has been, has been impressive, you know, has been, wow, uh, tremendous. And... Uh, I think I have to thank the coaches there. Uh, coach Tando, my assistant coach, is also the head of analysis uh, at UJ. You know, he does a lot of our set plays as well. And you have a lot of other people as well, the sports scientists. It was Kelvin Lomo, who's now with, uh, I think it's Simba in Tanzania. Yeah, you know, yeah. we had Obakin, who's now with the Springboks. Uh, the Blitzbox. Yeah, is it the Blitzbox? Yeah, you know, you have now uh, uh, Tony Doki, you know, is also with our rugby team and so forth. So these guys have done well, you know, in conditioning the players, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, there's more. Our medical department, well, even the, the whole technical team as a whole, you know, it's not just Coach Tando, it's all the other coaching interns that we have, mm -hmm. you know, our coaching mentees, you know, Coach Nukanyo, Josh, Josh, you know, uh, Tabo in the analysis department, you know, Mpo, mm -hmm. who's our logistics manager, we have the team manager, Tapelo, you know, yeah. uh, Coach Paseka, our goalkeeper coach, you know, there's so many. And then obviously the, the support system from management, you know, is key. Fefe, Nombilo, the, the four no's in my life are actually positive. Nombilo, <laughs> Nomsa, <laughs> Nombilo, it's, it's, actually it's five. five. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. only Fefe, Nombilo, Nombilo, Nomsa, Nolita. Yeah, so, oh yes, yes. Yeah, so that was the five no's in my life. Yes, yes. And all those five no's are actually positives in my in, in my coaching life here at, at UJ. Yeah. And uh, Look, without them, we would have struggled. They they helped me so much, you know. They 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 are they are also they also keep me uh, on your honest. toes. As well. Yeah, they yeah. keep me on my toes and honest. Uh, especially the last two knows. Uh, yeah, yeah. Doctor Nolita. They want you to bring the trophy. Yeah, they always want yeah. me to, to bring the trophy to UJ, and that's what I always. And you've done them. that. Yeah, that's what I've, I always promise them that I'll deliver the trophy. Yeah, you know, one way or another. And uh, what that has done is actually helped me to also improve my processes to ensure that I'm always, always uh, trying to, to be at the top of my game, mm. always. And uh, yeah, obviously, I'd like to uh, coach at a high level in the future. It was a possibility a year or two ago. It was a possibility, but yeah, at the time, I chose to remain with UJ because of the amount of work that I still think needs to be done to leave a proper foundation for, for future coaches of, of the UJ senior men's team, you know? Yeah, I, I believe I, I need to leave this place a better place, to leave a proper foundation. So that when they come here, they've got processes to follow, yeah. that they don't come here and... and, and Business and, and, the yeah, and not necessarily business, but land in a vacuum. Yes, so yes. So I want them to land in an environment with structures. So to, to, to set up those structures is not easy. Yeah. It takes time, it takes 
you know, like getting volunteers, but getting good volunteers. How do you screen them? You know, to say they must add value. They should come here and add value. How do you screen them? And that, that's, that's very important, mm -hmm. you know, because that's an important aspect as well that people miss. Yeah. Uh, getting quality volunteers to, to assist within the program. Yeah. So, yeah, I know I want to definitely coach at a high level in the future. Uh, but everything has, has its time. Has its own time. I always say your own pace, in your own lane, yeah, while running your own race. So, yeah, uh, I believe it will happen, but I'm not in a rush. Yeah. Uh, I'm not in a rush. Yeah. Uh, I'm not in a rush to get there. Yeah. It will happen. I believe in you, coach. I've seen your work. Um, personally, I think from 2021, uh, when I joined UJ Sport, I think I was, I was never really... I was that close, but not very close as I became from 2021 with UJ Sport. And uh, since I joined here, I have observed the different environments. Uh, we've got 11 teams here, uh, or clubs. And, um, you know, I've, I've observed the different teams. And when I saw you, I was like, this guy's got something uh, different that uh, brings success to UJ, especially when we played in the bubble. I think that was my first close uh, uh, interaction with you and the rest of the technical team and the team uh, team players um, and then we went into last year as well and i saw the consistency as well and then this year it just keeps on getting better so i thought um, i should sit down with you just hear from the man himself what um, uh, what he thinks of different things and what the future holds for him and i i can only wish you the best from here coach so well done for her, for for what you have done for you jay and I think when you live here, it's a legacy that many people will remember. Um, for me personally, I don't take it for granted. Um, I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to sit down with you and work with you like this uh, and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And um, I will remember you, I think, for a very long time. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. All right. That was Coach Karabu Mokhudi, the head coach of UJ senior men's team, uh, football team. Um, you guys have been seeing the UJ team doing very well, winning the, the different leagues, winning the varsity football tournament in 2021. And uh, I believe that they will lift that trophy again this year. Last year, they came very close and they lost in the final to Tswane University of Technology. Uh, but that's in the past. Now we look into the future and I believe that coach will deliver us to the promised land. Please tune into UJ Sport on UJ TV in the other episodes. Share your feedback with us in the comment section and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time. Thank you. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.